about, that you do have the decision to stop short of doing things that you would otherwise be permitted to do in circumstances where it would not be the right thing for you to do. We can talk a little bit later about what some of those things are. Uh, as our Supreme Court said a few years ago, the lawyer's duty to advocate zealously for the client is no excuse for unprofessional conduct that threatens to disrupt the courtroom. The idea that there's a conflict between zealous advocacy and ethical conduct is false. And I suspect that your courts and your bars would ascribe to the correctness of that particular idea. Well, then we get to the idea of what does professionalism mean? And of course the problem is it can be defined in 50 different ways. If all of us were given a sheet of paper right now and say give, give me a one sentence definition of professionalism, we would get probably as many versions of what that is as there are people in the room. And there's a, a cottage industry uh, now uh, in, legal, in the acad in academia about writing about the professionalism movement and what professional, professionalism is. Uh, a Georgia Supreme Court justice by the name of uh, Robert Benham, uh, although not too specific, but basically says, well, ethics is that which is required, professionalism is that which is expected. I think that's a pretty, a pretty good place to start. It's not a good place to end, but again, you all in the practice milieu that you have, there are things that your professional peers in the courts expect you to do. They're not in the rules, but they expect you to do this because that is what professionals do. So that's a pretty good place to start, but then what are the attributes, perhaps, of, of what professionalism looks like? And many people hearken back to Potter Stewart when he, in J Jacob Ellis versus Ohio, when he was defining obscenity, what Potter Stewart said was, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Well, professionalism uh, is perhaps as elusive as that, but I, if you don't mind, I'd like to suggest to you six earmarks of what professionalism means for lawyers. The first one is accountability. And what I mean by that is you've got to take responsibility for your actions. Uh, you know, uh, and your decisions. You've got to take responsibility for the work that the you, people you are supervising, you own it. Or some people say, you own it, you broke it, you fix it. You've just got to take responsibility and be accountable for your own decisions and actions. Uh, secondly, it's the, the, the concept of consideration. That, that you are aware of the effects of your actions are having on other people. Many of us do things unintentionally sometimes. We're all human. And you know, buttons can get pushed and we do things without thinking. But most of our professional life is spent doing things in a calculated, pre-planned way. And it's very important to when we're coming up with how we're going to approach something, what we're going to say, and how we're going to say it, to figure out how is this going to sit on the people that hear me saying it. And when we do that, we can calibrate our message in a way where it's going to be more effective than it is to uh, uh, get people upset. And, and I'm sure every one of you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've had to deliver bad news. If you deliver it bluntly, you get one answer. If you deliver it, deliver it empathetically, it's the same news, but the reaction's different. So part of it is being aware of what you do and say and the, how the effect that's having on others. Another is civility. Uh, and of course, civility means you're going to be respectful, you're going to be courteous, uh, you're going to be cordial. Uh, there's nothing inconsistent with being a zealous representative uh, uh, a zealous uh, uh, advocate uh, by being courteous, cordial, and, and uh, 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 consistently uh, courteous. Uh, one of the best litigators in, in, in the 20th century was a lawyer at, at, in New York, Davis Polk, named uh, Robert Fisk. And you know, Fisk had his clients, the Mets. He was the first special counsel in the Whitewater proceeding. He was the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. 
he was one of the toughest litigators in New York. And uh, when he received an award from the American Indian Court about two years ago, hundreds of letters nominating him came in. And everything, what the common denominator in all the remarks about him was that he made me a better lawyer. Because, and this is his adversaries, not just people he's working with. Because he treated everybody with respect, he listened, he communicated in an effective way. So here we have one of the best advocates in the American legal system. He did it by not adopting a scorch earth, it's my way or the highway. He did that by acting civilly and courteously to everybody he dealt with. Uh, a little dose of humility is not a bad thing for professionalism because, let's face it, we all made mistakes. I've made at least 10 today. Uh, we don't know everything that we need to know all the time. So uh, it's nice uh, to go around, remind yourself, you might be the smartest person in the room, but you don't have to act like you are. Collegiality is important. Uh, you know, we do have duties to our clients, but we also have relationships with other members of the bar, with the courts, uh, and uh, we should never let our, our professional responsibilities to clients sour our relationship to our colleagues at the bar. Your bar's getting bigger, Nashville bar's getting bigger, but the old, adi uh, the old adage, what goes around comes around, still works in Nashville. It might take a little bit longer to come around, but it comes around. We are all being guided by the approbation of our peers. So a collegial environment like an inn of court, like your bar association, like your dealings at motion day at the courthouse, uh, a collegial atmosphere is going to help. Uh, you know, divorce litigation, for example, is very, can, can be very contentious, especially when the clients are very upset with each other. Uh, uh, I know of one lawyer in town who, who adopted the strategy of Anytime she took a case, her first act was to call the lawyer on the other side, whether she knew that lawyer or not, and say, let's have lunch. What do we got? Let's just talk about what we have here. And it was that, that discussion ended up toning down the, the headbutting that would have otherwise gone on. When you know people, when you work with people, your trust level in them goes up, their trust level in you goes up, uh, practice is hard enough, uh, you add the contentiousness to it, it makes it even harder. Uh, you can dial all that back with a dose of collegiality. And of course we know that, that Shakespeare, uh, in Taming of the Shrew, Shrew, told us that we ought to strive mightily in court, but then eat and drink as friends. Uh, and that holds true today. One of my uh, favorite U.S. District judges in Nashville, a guy by the name of Thomas Aquinas Higgins, when he was asked why was the bar, uh, what was wrong with today's Nashville bar, he just said, we don't drink enough whiskey together. <laughs> yeah. We laugh, but there is truth in what he said. We can drink iced tea instead of whiskey. We're just not together enough. And then the uh, final uh, as aspect of professionalism I'd suggest is consistency. And that is you just don't turn it on and off, but you try to treat people with dignity and respect no matter whether they're in the clerk's office, whether they're your opposing counsel, whether the person that's holding the door open for you at the front of the courthouse, uh, whether it's the person who is selling you something at the quick sack when you're running in because you don't have time to eat a good lunch. It's the idea of trying to treat everyone about the same way you like to be treated. And, and again, all these things are aspirational. They're not easily done. But I'm suggesting to you that those six uh, attributes might help you hone in a little bit more on what your version of, of being a professional is. So treating everybody the same way. All right, that's my sermon. Now we're going to start talking about some uh, vignettes some ethical circumstances. And what we're going to ask ourselves in each one of these circumstances, and again, we're, all, we're, all, we're going, we're not going to take them all because we have a time limit here. We'll take two or three. Uh, 
what I'm going to do is, is give you the circumstance and ask someone to volunteer what they think the answer is. So the brave person who volunteers to give the answer will win a goofy. All right? So the first one, here's the circumstance. The, the constraints you have in referring a prospective client to another lawyer when you have a conflict of interest in the case. And so the first question is going to be, can you do that? And the second question is, if you can, how should you do it? And the third question is, should you do it? You know, what would be the practical constraints that you might have to deal with if you uh, want to refer a client that you're not going to represent to another party because you're already representing somebody in the dispute? So who wants to get the first Google to answer the question? Can you do that? Do, does the, do the Code of Professional Conduct, Rules of Professional Conduct, permit a lawyer to do that? Hello? <laughs> Google. <-goo. laughs> I'm going to call on someone. I'm just going to start pointing. No volunteers? All hands. All right, we've got a volunteer. You're next. Okay. You're handling okay. first. Yes, you can do that. You can. You're right. You win a good. There is no ethical prohibition against referring a client in that circumstance. The question is, what problems is that going to create for you if you do it? Um, I mean, it depends on how much money you've. I mean, that, how much information you've already gotten. So let's say someone calls you in, and it's just trying to get you to represent them and you haven't technically agreed to represent them, you can easily just be like, well, I refer you to this firm. But if you already have confidential information from them, then that would, I guess, would pose an issue. How do you get around that issue? I don't know the answer. Well, one of the ways you get around it is you make your conflict determination before they disclose too much of that information. <coughs> So, I mean, there is a way around, but that, that you're exactly right. The more information you have, the more your hands are going to be tied in terms of, of what you can do. What other problems do you have? Can you accept a fee for the referral? That's a, that's a real problem. What do you think the answer is? I don't think you can. No. You're shaking your head no, you're right. You want to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, you, you certainly cannot accept a fee, but what, what's the most, what's the practical problem you're going to have? You want to help this person out. They, they really need to have a lawyer. This is a fairly complicated case. You don't want to have to deal with another pro se litigant. Who, who's your biggest problem? Your client. Your client is your biggest problem, right? Why is your client going to be your biggest problem? Because you sent an adversary to a lawyer that you you send your adversary to a good lawyer. Well, now, under the rules of professional conduct, is that an ethical problem? No. No, it's not an ethical problem at all. But it certainly is a huge problem for a client who says, who are you representing me? And so you're going to you have to ask yourself, am I going to be able to explain to that client that this litigation is going to go more smoothly and better by having someone who knows what he or she's doing versus some cowboy. But it's primarily because of the client's reaction to your doing it. Because again, do you have a duty to inform your client what, that you've done it? Some would say you did. And so as soon as you inform your client that, oh, I referred party X to another lawyer, you're going to have to explain it. The client's not going to like it. So the most practical decision is going to be as much as you want to be altru altruistic and help this person out, the better thing to do is say, I can't represent you. And if they say, can you refer me to somebody, hey, I would certainly like to help you, but I, I am not in a position where I can do that. So, so the practicality, here's your good. The practicality of that would, would counsel that we back off. Well, let's look at another situation. What about representing a non-party witness in the deposition of the proceeding where you're also representing the main party? All right, this goes on all the time. 
right? I mean, you're representing a company. They want to enter. They want to depose one of the employees of the company. Uh, um, it's going to be expensive to get another lawyer. It's going to be complicated to get it in there. You're going to, you know, I'll just take that on. Is that is that pro, is that ethically permitted? Yes. 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 yes, it is. Are there any guardrails you need to put up? We have to yes. tell the we have to tell the non-party that you are counsel for the for the party that you represent the party. Right. We have to make that clear. All right, and let's assume you do that. You said I'm already representing this party, but I'm going to, I'm going to be taking on this representation. That person is now your client, isn't it? Isn't that person a client of yours now? If you're taking on the representation of the witness, could be a limited representation. Exactly. That you you both get good. <laughs> so so the first thing is that that yes, they're your client, but you have to go through the process of the disclosure and the sign-offs and the, the, the approvals for a limited representation for your client, for both clients. Because you're also going to have to tell the same thing to your real client, right? And part of that comp complexity is going to be what? Confidential information. Because now you also have a joint representation, don't you? And so you got to explain that. Uh, there's one other problem that you could have if you're taking on representation of a witness. Anybody figure out another problem you have? They're not adverse to each other. Pardon? They are not adverse to each other. You ha yes, you have to make that determination that they're not of adverse and you have a big problem. But the other problem is this. It's a matter of timing. That, 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 and there are some bar associations that have addressed this squarely, but you're representing the company. You're going to represent an employee of the company at a deposition. You've gone through all those steps, and you figured, I, I can take care of all these ethical issues. And so you pick up the phone, and you call the employee and say, Mr. Smith, I'm, I'm going to be representing you. What problem do we have? we got a solicitation problem. Right. Yeah. You know, so how how do you how would you get around that? Tell the corporate client to inform the employee and have him call you. Exactly. What you do if you're going to do that? Say, you know, it'll be a lot more efficient for us to handle this case if we if we handle if we represent this witness. It's not adverse. There's not going to be be a big problem. Would you talk to the witness to tell them that we are prepared to represent him or her in this? If you want to talk to the, this lawyer, and if, if the witness says, sure, I'll talk to the lawyer, then you didn't solicit the business, the client solicited the business. Good word. The was are disappearing. It, it becomes very complicated, though, when the non-party witness is a former employee of your corporate client. It absolutely does, and that's why I'm trying to keep it simple. I mean, we, I mean, we can make these very, very, very complicated without a question. If you get into some corporate litigation where you've got boards being represented, corporations being represented, former employees, it gets to be Byzantine. I, I was just, please, we can spend the rest of the night on this. All right. Well. Can a lawyer seek advantage for a client in a civil dispute by threatening a separate non-criminal proceeding against an adverse party? No. That was a pretty strong no. Where's that? Why not? You cannot threaten a, you cannot threaten a criminal prosecution to achieve a civil prosecution. I said non, it's a non-criminal. Oh, We're not threatening. I'm gonna I'm gonna report you to the bar. <laughs> I'm gonna have you indicted. This is we're gonna sue you for libel if you do this. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. You can do that. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Under your version of 
the rules of professional I'm being a zealous representative. I, I can do this, absolutely. That's right. right. Now, you're going to get a good one, but I'm not turning you loose yet. <laughs> Let me ask you. Can you do that if you have absolutely no intention of suing them? Yes. You think so? Well, it's a question of how. I mean, I, I can't make a false statement. Yes. Um, but I can certainly imply something. Well, you think you can imply it? You can't make a threat in bad faith. That's well, true. That's what we all. That's the that's the morass you get into. I mean, if in fact your client is prepared to sue someone civilly for conduct in another case, and they're going fully prepared to carry that out, as a matter of fact, they've even told you to go ahead and start drafting your complaint, you're going to be in a lot better circumstance than saying, well, we're just going to sue your ass. <laughs> now, and in the materials I gave you in New York and some other places, uh, they, they've raised extortion, they've raised bad faith, uh, so you've got to be very careful about how, what you're going to say the consequences of, of the conduct might be. And you've got to be ready, if you draw the line, you've got to be ready to walk over it. Just to well, you run into Rule 11 sanction problem, too, if you're filing something, a frivolous lawsuit, for example, to Absolutely, absolutely. That, that, that's why you, if you're going to make the statement, you better be ready to back it up. You, you better have a substantive basis to do it. All right, uh, we just had that. All right, here's a fun one. Inadvertent release or receipt of confidential information. Now let, let's face it, with computers in the practice today and the reliance we have, uh, the, the, the need to get electronically stored information. Let's face it, the, the risk of inadvertently releasing client information is significant, even for the best lawyers. It's, it's just going to happen. So the question becomes, uh, what obligations do you have with regard to the protection of your client information, and there are going to be lawyers in the room, I suspect, that can tell us stories about how prospective clients send them a questionnaire that they have to fill out about what their firm's IT practices and security are. Uh, there are some clients, uh, HCA for example, up in Nashville, that actually sends in a team of IT experts to examine the law firm's computer infrastructure to decide whether there's enough security that the law firm uses and its protocols were sufficiently enforced that it minimizes the risk of the inadvertent release of their data. But the fact is, it's going to happen. So the question becomes, what do the et rules of ethics require? What does the, would the canons of professionalism require if uh, you find out that uh, in a dump of information, some confidential, confidential information got in the hands of the opposing counsel. What is a professional going to do? Anybody? Claude back. Pardon? Claude back. Claude back. Now, claw sounds like a pretty dramatic word. <laughs> what? What? You take up the phone and say I inadvertently released uh, yes. information. I think we're going to start there. Yeah, we're going. Call up and say, Harry, you know, we sent you something the other day, you shouldn't have got it, would you mind uh, sending it back? Could you tell me if you distributed it anywhere? And hopefully Harry's a professional and says, look, it could happen to any of us, we'll send it back. But let's assume Harry doesn't like you. And so you know, he's gonna say, oh no, I, this is really pretty good stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you in the world or about this. Then when you Well, that, that, that is one of the first things you're going to have to do is inform your client that there's some stuff out there in the free world that was a mistake and you're going to get it back. 
But what, do you have any judicial remedies? You're going to have, you're going to have a remedy in federal court if you put it in the pretrial order, yeah. and follow the rules, yeah. follow all the requirements, yeah. and it's not a waiver. You mind if I throw you in this good room? And that, that is actually one of the differences, big differences between the Tennessee rules and the Alabama rules. We now have detailed rules on what one must do uh, when information is released. And the issue comes up is it can impact the duty of competence. You know, 1.1 says we have to represent people competently, and inadvertently releasing this information can raise that question. We know we rely on paralegals and non-lawyer staff to do a whole lot of things, but under rule, is it rule 502, 503, we're responsible for the lawyers and the non-lawyers who are working under our supervision. So what a professional, professional has to do is own it. You may not have done it, but when your adversary calls you and say, Bill, I've got this set of documents here, I think it's privileged, uh, even if it was somebody on your team, you had no idea that it had happened. You've got to own it. You've got to talk to the client, say this is out there. And you've got to deal with the other side about trying to get it back. And if you can't do that amicably, then you have to seek some judicial uh, uh, remedies for that to the extent that those judicial remedies are available. But I think the point is here, though, for those of you who say that will never happen to me, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. You know, I, I, hate, I hate to tell you. And it's the same thing with the courts. I mean, the security of the, of the judicial materials. It, yes, we think we're bulletproof. It's just a question when before our computers and servers get hacked and that stuff gets out. So we just, we have a duty of competence. Actually, in Tennessee now, we have a specific rule that requires competence with regard to electronically stored information. We now have to have CLE on. All right, so here's what a lawyer ought to do in terms of confidential information. This message contains confidential and or legally privileged information. Unintended recipients may not use, copy, or disclose any portion of this transmission. Say that in your prayers at night. <laughs> Take care of it. All right, one more and then I'm going to stop. And, and that is the use of social media for investigative purposes. Now, we all know that the social media contains a whole lot of personal information. A lot of people could care less about what they put up there, and it's in the public domain. And so I'm not talking about here about stuff that's in the public domain. If somebody's uh, uh, put stuff out there, that's on them. And it's almost a violation of standard of care now, in my mind, if you're selecting juries, if you're even interviewing potential employees, if you're not checking the Facebook pages and all that sort of stuff to see what's going on, you're missing a lot. What I'm talking about here is information on social media that the person has not intended to be made public. You know, it's on a private Facebook page. To what extent can lawyers uh, uh, use subterfuges to friend somebody in order to get access to their page? Uh, uh, act like they're not a lawyer, but they're their next door neighbor or the dog catcher. To what extent can lawyers use subterfuges to get access to otherwise confidential information? You can or can't? Yeah. I don't have enough good news for everybody. <laughs> I heard you first. It's a benefit of being in front row. I mean, of course you can. The, the rules on elect for electronic communication are essentially the same as for written communication. You know, you cannot use a subterfuge to get access to that sort of information. Uh, as I said, there are about four or five other scenarios in the materials, but I think we're reaching the witching hour, and I'm, I do have three more goodies left, and I don't want to take them back to Nashville, because they will not get back to Nashville. <laughs> uh, and so if there are any of you that need to take a Google home to your children or to your spouse, or you just want to use that as an excuse to get a Google. There are three up here. I, I want to thank you for attention, your attention. I hope this has been helpful. I wish both of your ends of court great success. Uh, and perhaps if I'm on good behavior, you'll invite me back some.